So this, uh, in this session, I'll be dealing with two main topics. What is the gospel and who is a Christian? What is the gospel and who is a Christian? A while ago, in a church that I used to attend, there was a man who was very passionate about evangelizing and talking to people about God. So on a Christmas day, a couple said, uh, came and sat in the pews to pray in that church. So this man went to speak with them. So after a while, he came back rejoicing. I asked him what happened. He said that he shared the gospel with them and they got saved. I was a bit surprised. It was so quick. Then I asked him what it was that he shared with them. He said, the gospel. I probed him a bit more to know what he believed to be the gospel. After discussing it with him for about some time, he shared what, he had, what had happened. He went to that couple and asked them what they wanted from God. And they said, they were praying for a house. They are non-Christians. So he told them that if they put their trust in God, he would certainly give them a house as they desired it. Then he asked them whether they want to believe in this God. They said yes. And he asked them to pray with him and they did. They are saved, he said. Do you think they are really saved? Did he really preach the gospel to them? I was a bit taken aback by that confession, so I got curious about his story and asked him how he got saved. He said that there was a time when he was jobless, so he came to the city in search of a job. He was traveling somewhere and asked someone for a lift. So he got a lift, and as they were going, the person who gave him the lift started a conversation with him. When he heard that this man was jobless, he immediately shared with him that if he trusted in Jesus, that he would certainly get a job, just as it happened to him. That day, he said, he trusted Jesus for a job and became a Christian. Do you think he's really a Christian? I tried to open the word of God with him to help him see the truth. But he said, we do not need the Bible. If we love God from our hearts, that's more than enough. Is that true? Recently, I met a family. And while talking to them, I asked them whether they were saved. They confidently said, yes. And I asked them, how? They said they were Christians by birth and that they have been attending their local church regularly and their kids also grew in that church so they too are saved. Then I asked them if they were to die today will they go to heaven to be with Jesus? They were disappointed with that question and said they still need to change a lot and that they were trying to become good people so that they can enter into heaven. Do you think a person becomes a Christian by just being born into a Christian family or attending church regularly? Can someone be saved by their good works? I come across a lot of people who call themselves Christians but have no knowledge of who God is, why Jesus died on the cross, and what it means to be a Christian. But still, they call themselves to be Christians. In a lot of rural places, especially in Telugu states, many pastors baptize people who do not have any proper understanding of God, sin, or salvation. There is a belief that baptism itself saves. That is what they are taught. So they take baptism and think that they are Christians now. 
Do you think that they are really baptized Christians? These are just few, a few of many cases. Some people think that the gospel is all about healing or wealth or prosperity or liberation. They think that it's all about having a better life now or better societies now in this world. There is a lot of confusion about what the gospel is and what it means to be a Christian. So there are many ways people are defining these terms. See, unless we define those words or concepts properly, understanding them is impossible. For example, if I talk to you about an animal, if I talk to you about an animal, and you think it is a dog, but I think it's a cat in my mind, then do you think that we are on the same page of understanding? It's impossible, isn't it? We must have the clarity about words to communicate properly. If that is true, even in little cases, how much more clarity do we need to have about things that matter to us deeply and affect us eternally? We need clarity. So I see a greater need to clarify those terms that we generally use in, even in our churches today. Like, what is the gospel? What is baptism? What is sin? What is salvation? And what is a Christian? So today, we will deal with two important questions. What is the gospel and what is a Christian? Instead of asking people about their opinions, let us turn to God and see what he says about this in his word. We believe that the Bible is God's holy word. All the 66 books in the Bible are inspired by God. That is, they're written by people who are moved by the Holy Spirit in that what they wrote is exactly what God wanted them to write. We believe that the Bible is trustworthy because God is trustworthy. He speaks the truth. So we must listen to him. So where do we find a clear and basic explanation of the gospel in the Bible? It is in the letter written by the Apostle Paul to Romans, chapters 1 through 4. So if we can turn our Bibles to the book of Romans, or the epistle of Romans, chapters 1 through 4. Now, Paul was an apostle writing to Christians in Rome to introduce himself, his ministry, and what he believed. In chapter 1, from verse 1 through 17, he uses the word gospel four times. He says that he is set apart by God for the gospel of God in verse 1. In verse 9, he says he serves God in the gospel of his son. And in verse 15, he says that he is eager to preach the gospel. And in verse 16, he says that he is not ashamed of the gospel. Then after that, from verses 18 onwards, chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 26, he explains what the gospel is in detail. He addresses the questions like, who is God? What is man's problem? What is the solution to man's problem? And what man should do about it? So in the rest of chapter 1, from verse 18, Paul shows that there is a God in heaven who revealed himself to people. He says that it is plain in the creation and it can be clearly perceived through reason. So people are also aware of God's law. In verse 32, he says that. However, people, in spite of knowing the truth about God, they chose to suppress it and they deliberately chose to dishonor God. We can see that in verse 18 onwards. Chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth.
instead of worshiping god they worshiped the things created by god they not only practiced evil but also led other people into it where study do you see that so paul says god revealed his wrath against all sinners and gave them up to their own sins it is mentioned three times in this chapter in verse 24 26 and 28 since this is the case there is no excuse for anyone verse 20 verse 20 there is no excuse for anyone nobody can plead ignorance before god so on that final day nobody can stand before god and say you did not give me any evidence for me to believe in you that's why i didn't follow you nobody can say that we should not one thing here everyone in this world is accountable to god he or she must give an account of their life how they lived it out and what they had believed and why do we realize that we are in that group too you and i are also accountable to god now what kind of god is he what kind of a god is he he is a god who loves righteousness and hates ungodliness and unrighteousness he is god of eternal power and divine nature he is a god who judges people for their actions and has authority to punish sinners the bible teaches that this god is sovereign eternal holy righteous and just so god must punish those who sin by no means he has punished them now the question is who has sinned who has sinned in chapters 2 and 3 of romans paul builds his case showing that both gentiles and jews have sinned against god's law both gentiles and jews gentiles are those who are other than jews so it's like saying both desis and paradesis have sinned or it's like saying both malayalis and non malayalis have sinned gentiles had the law in their hearts and the jews had the law in their hands no matter what both the groups or all of them have failed to keep the law perfectly so all have sinned against this holy god that is why paul says in chapter 3 verse 10 none is righteous no not one no one understands no one seeks for god all have turned aside together they have become worthless no one does good not even one that lives no one right not even you and me now what is sin now what is sin and how serious is it before god sin is you know missing the mark of god's law transgressing the law or simply disobeying or offending god and despising god we can also say that not giving the glory that is due to god is sin adam and eve sinned by eating that forbidden fruit by doing that they have challenged god and his authority over them see when we look at sin only in external actions like you know sinning with eyes mouth hands we might miss a point sometimes Now the bible says we are sinful by nature we are born with sin sin is in the deepest part of our hearts and comes out like springs of water affecting every part of our being it affects our thinking our seeing our listening our speaking our actions our motives you know that is why we get dirty thoughts we lust with our eyes we have itching ears to listen to bad stuff we curse with our mouths we hurt others with our hands and we have evil intentions in our hearts towards others is it not true of us 
Is it not true of us? We all do experiences, right? Sin is more dangerous than we always think. It kills. That is why the Bible says that we are dead in our sins and trespasses. We are dead. We can do nothing about it. It also says that the wages of sin is death. That's an eternal one. That's an eternal one. So we need to understand that the intensity of the punishment for our sins depends upon the value and authority of the person against whom we have sinned. May I repeat that again? The intensity of the punishment for our sin depends upon the value and authority of the person against whom we have sinned. We have sinned against the eternal sovereign God who is of infinite value and worth. Do you see that? Even a small sin against him is worthy of eternal and infinite punishment. Small sin in our sight. But for him it's a big sin. That is why hell is eternal. And an infinitely torturous place. You and I rightly deserve that. Because we have sinned against this kind of a God. If only we can feel the weight of our sin, then we can understand the need for forgiveness, the depth of God's love for us, and the height of his mercy and grace. Now what did God do by looking at our miserable state? Now what did God do by looking at our miserable state? Paul talks about it in the second part of chapter 3 and chapter 4. Romans 3, 21 to 26 is the most beautiful passage in the Bible that gives hope for the lost sinner. If you can turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. Let me just read it. But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now look at verse 21 here. Look at verse 21. What has been manifested? What has been manifested? The righteousness of God. How was it manifested? Apart from the law. That's what Paul says here. Apart from the law. This verse is not saying that God is showing that he is righteous. But he is showing us his righteousness as if it is an object. Paul goes on to say that this righteousness is apart from the law. Not from the law. It's apart from the law. Now we know that righteousness generally comes by keeping the law. But here it is different. God is showing us a righteousness that is not coming from the law by keeping the law. But it's coming from himself. To what end is he showing it? In verse 22, in verse 22, he says, It is for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. So God is giving his righteousness to those who trust in Jesus Christ. All those who trust in Jesus are justified, treated as right before God. It is by his grace. It is a gift from God 
for their faith in Jesus. We can see from this that this holy, righteous, and just God is gracious, merciful, and loving too. He's gracious, merciful, and loving too. Now what did Jesus do that all those who put their faith in him should be justified freely? Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the one who is equal with God the Father and God the Spirit, who existed from eternity, took upon himself flesh and came into this world through Virgin Mary. He is truly God and truly man in one person. He lived a perfect and holy life on this earth. No one was able to point a sin in him. He lived a perfect and holy life on this earth. Why? We may say that he is because, because he is God. That is true too. But the other reason is that because we have failed to live a perfect and holy life before God. He lived it on our behalf. So we must get to this. This small phrase, on our behalf, makes much difference. He lived it on our behalf. We failed it, but he lived it. Then he took all our sin upon him and died on that cross on our behalf. We should die there, but he died on our behalf. That is all the sins of all those who trust him at all times were put on him. He bore our sins on that cross and he experienced the wrath of God on our behalf. Again, how did he die? By absorbing the wrath of God that was supposed to come upon us. He took our punishment. Because he is God in the flesh who is of infinite value and worth, the few hours of punishment that he bore on the cross was enough to pay for all our sins eternally. And because he is man, he is a perfect substitute. He is a perfect substitute. He died on that cross. He was buried in a grave. But on the third day, he rose again from the grave, defeating sin and death that kept us in chains for a long time. Now to all those who repent of their sins and believe that Jesus lived on their behalf and died on their behalf and rose again from the grave, God grants them forgiveness of sins and gives them eternal life. Life that will never be taken away from them. That is good news. That is the gospel. It is through faith we receive them from God. It is God's gift for those who repent and put their faith in Jesus. My friends, my friends, did you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus and his work on the cross to save you from your sins? If not, please, I urge you to turn from your sins and consider Jesus and trust him alone for your salvation. He is the only way to eternal life. There is no other way. And if you are already believing him, praise God. Please continue to hold on to him for your dear life. Now what happens to a person who believes? Now what happens to a person who believes? We know the Bible gives a lot of explanation of that. He is fully forgiven. He is justified. He is clothed with Christ's righteousness. He is adopted as a son. He is transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's son. He gets a new heart with new desires. He is a new creation in Christ now. He becomes a Christian. He becomes a Christian. So it's true for both man and woman. It's true for both man and woman. <coughs> what does 
a Christian's life look like after his conversion? There are four things that I want to share. The first one is a Christian loves righteousness and hates sin. A Christian loves righteousness and hates sin. Ezekiel 36, 26. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26 says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is what God's going to do to those who trust him and trust Jesus. This is true of every Christian. This is true of every Christian. God gives us a new heart and a new spirit. Paul says in Ephesians 1 that God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit. This happens the moment when a person trusts in Christ for their salvation. From then on, the Spirit of God lives in them and helps them to grow in sanctification. There will be a change and progress in the Christian life, Christian's life towards godliness. If we do not see any change or interest to grow in righteousness in a person who claims to be a Christian, then we can be sure that person is never a Christian. So my friends, how are you all growing in holiness? How are you all growing in holiness? Do you see yourself progressing in Christian virtues like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? These are the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. If you look back to the last week or to the last month or to the last year in your life, do you see a significant change in your character? Friends, we need to keep examining our lives very often. The second one is a Christian loves God's word. A Christian loves God's word. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2 says, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk <coughs> that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So do we long for God's word? In Psalm 119, in Psalm 119, the psalmist uses the word delight to express his feelings towards God's word. Verse 14, 16, 22, 35, 47, 70, 77, 92, 143, and 147. In all these verses, he says, I delight in your law. I delight in your commandments. I delight in your testimonies. I delight in your statutes. The psalmist expresses his delight in God's word. A Christian delights in God's word. Do we find in this world a Christian who does not love the Bible? Do we find in this world a Christian who does not love, love the Bible? I don't think so. A Christian knows that when he opens the Bible and reads it, God speaks to him. God speaks to him. Those who desire God will love to hear from Him. But just think about it. Do you have any loved ones with whom you do not want to talk? Do you love somebody so much that you do not want to talk to them? Sounds crazy, isn't it? Even so, it's crazy to see a Christian not longing to read or listen to God's word. Number three, a Christian is not ashamed of the gospel. A Christian is not ashamed of the gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul says, 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. That name, being a Christian. A Christian rejoices in and gladly identifies himself with Jesus publicly. He'll not be ashamed to openly declare before people that he belongs to Jesus. Now we know how the world is today and we know what consequences a Christian must face if he does that. There will be sufferings for a person who becomes a Christian. But still, but still, he will never be ashamed of it. He will never be ashamed of it. And my friends, let us let us pause and think. Do we shy away from calling ourselves Christians before our friends or colleagues or non-Christians? Do people who surround you know that you are a Christian? Can they spot you out? Can they see that you are different from them? We need to ask these questions. And do we hesitate too much to share the gospel with others? Are we ashamed of it? We must examine our hearts to see where we stand in those things. And the final one is, a Christian submits to the local church. A Christian submits to the local church. If we can turn to Acts chapter 2 verse 42. Acts chapter 2 verse 42. <clears throat> Onwards. It says here, and they, that is Christians, that is people who are born again, the people who trusted in Jesus. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Now watch this last sentence. Now watch this last sentence here in 47. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. In these verses, what are Christians committed to? The Lord is adding whom to whom? So if you see here, Christians commit themselves to the local church. It is in the context of a local church that Christian grows in their understanding of God and grows into the likeness of Christ. That is the way God designed it to happen. A Christian cannot obey God's word without being in the local church. For him to practice his Christianity, he needs other Christians. It is not an option for a Christian, but a command to be in fellowship with other Christians so that they can love, serve, bear, forgive, and encourage one another. And these are all from the Bible. The church is a family for a Christian. The church is a family for a Christian. Now who in the world says that he is a part of a family but is, does not want to be with the family? Is there anyone like that? You say I have a family but I don't want to be with them? There might be exceptions. But if you love your family, you want to be with them, right? And that is how a Christian is who does not want to be a part of the local church. A 
Christians should desire to commit themselves to the local church. Now may I ask you, how is your commitment to your local church? Do you treat your church members as your family, your brothers and sisters? True Christians take these things seriously. Are we taking them seriously? So I pray, let it be so with us too. Let it be so with us too. So as uh, we were singing the third song, the third stanza says, See him there upon the cross, no longer breathing. No longer breathing. Why? The last two verses. He stood before the wrath of God, shielding sinners with his blood. Do we realize what Jesus had done for us on that cross? Not just for us individually, but for us as a church. He's saving his church. He's building his church. One day he'll come and take his church to be with him. And if you and I trust in Jesus, we are in that church.